Yes. Uh, because we will be starting with um, uh, one third of this uh, of the duration of uh, the sessions today dedicated to uh, presentations, while the two third will be uh, for group work. So we are urging you all to uh, uh, continue uh, participating with us and uh, to uh, effectively participate during the training uh, exercises and to ask whatever questions uh, you have in mind. Uh, also, um, uh, today we'll be starting with uh, a presentation that will be delivered by Sara uh, that will combine uh, two presentations, two topics, the one, the last one of the day four, which was not delivered uh, at that time, and uh, the one of the first one of today. Uh, so um, I'm going now to give the floor to Sara and uh, good luck, and uh, we're looking forward to, forward to having uh, uh, interactive uh, sessions today. Thank you very much. To you, Sarah. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all well. Indeed, this is uh, the final week, so we have uh, great hopes that you've spent the weekend digesting all the information we've given and that you're now all impact assessment experts. We have, we have huge expectations that tomorrow you will give such uh, good presentations, your analysis of the situation um, with the World Heritage Property in, in Bethlehem will amaze us all because we also have uh, Eugene back with us tomorrow to help moderate that session. So we both want you to stay calm but also feel a lot of pressure that you will change the world of impact assessment with your analysis. <laughs> That's just a little encouragement for today. Um, just to remind us that last week with the presentations, we finished discussing uh, most of the steps of the impact assessment. So we got to the point of talking about how we'll actually look at identifying impacts and then how you might uh, decide the, the seriousness of them. Um, so in terms of the group work, we covered all the material necessary, all the steps to lead you up to uh, a, creating uh, a final report. So you've had everything now for that. This morning, the presentations that I'm going to give are simply um, some concluding thoughts before we let you uh, carry out the exercises. So what we're looking at this morning is very much what happens after you've produced your final report, what are the steps that then take place? Because the report itself is, is a very useful milestone, but it's not the end of the story. Um, so unless anyone has any particular questions, I think it's useful just to get on with the final presentations um, and then we can get to work. So I will share my screen. Yes, uh, Sarah, there are no questions, so we can go ahead. Great. I'm expecting by now you're all very good at raising your hands if you want something. <laughs> so you'll interrupt me. So as, um, as I just said, there is uh, the question of what happens next. Um, imagine that last week you're all in a position to write an excellent report. Uh, and that report is then very useful for going to the national, whoever is your national authorities making decisions about an impact assessment, and it goes to the World Heritage Committee, and there will be discussions um, about is this project going to happen, yes or no. Um, the report itself is obviously, uh, it's the idea is that it's evidence-based, there's a lot of data, there's clear analysis. When there is a review of the report, we're simply talking here, not about the final decision being made, we're talking about people looking at it to see if it is fit for purpose. Does it say everything we need to know? And there's lots of moments of review. Now, this is something that a lot of you might not be, some of you might be involved in, it depends on your roles in your various um, jobs, but it's worth knowing who it is that reviews these reports because then you write a better report as a result. Very often the proponent does a review. Now we've used the proponent before and I don't think I've probably, properly explained who this can be. Proponent simply means the person who's proposing the project. 
and this could be a private developer, but we're also finding very often the proponent might be a government agency. It can sometimes be the Ministry of Transport who's building a road, and then they will do a review of the report to see if it's what they need. But you will see the second point, you'll also have another national authority. It might be the Ministry of the Environment, for example, who has the responsibility for checking with regard to legislation. So you're already getting multiple departments reading these reports. Many countries have the opportunity for these uh, reports to be public, um, and this can take quite a long time. Sometimes that simply means posting it on a website, uh, but it needs to be uh, clear to you that you might also have a lot of public scrutiny, especially for sensitive projects. The World Heritage Committee has its own review process, and once you send something to the World Heritage Centre, the advisory bodies review each and every one of these reports um, when the committee is asked for them. And you do sometimes have an independent review. Now, this it depends on the country. Uh, not all countries have them for every case, but they can be particularly useful if, this, if the project is a very sensitive one. And it's something that could be requested. Specialists can come and provide a review. And I must repeat, the review is not these people deciding. The review is people saying, do we have the information necessary to make an informed decision? So it may be that uh, the consult is usually consultants who actually write these reports. It might be that after the review, they're asked to revise in some way and improve the report so this is clearer. So it's also useful for you to know that you can request that. If your consultants aren't very good, if you get a Sarah and a Scania who write you a report and show that uh, they haven't understood things, or they haven't expressed themselves clearly, you have the absolute right to insist that they improve the work. And it's worth you knowing that. And it's only after that review process that a decision is made. Now we need to remember in the case of World Heritage, the World Heritage Committee might make a, a statement, a decision on these cases, but the decision-making power is always within the state party. Um, World Heritage doesn't try to take any, any state party's powers away from them. But it, it's therefore much more important that your decision makers are aware of the World Heritage implications. It's even more important that they can understand what it means for World Heritage. Now, in theory, that's the, the end of our story of our report. But I think it's worth just taking two minutes to understand what then happens. There's, there's my image of this beautiful report that has been written, yet another document written for World Heritage. And there is our uh, potential World Heritage property, you can see. Exactly how does that report have any relationship with reality in the place that you're working? Now, it's really important to understand um, there is a very useful mechanism you can use uh, to make sure that the report actually has positive uh, outcomes for the World Heritage. Now, we've already said the impact assessment team writes a report. And you'll remember from last week, one of the things it will include are recommendations for mitigation. And this might uh, usually involves also recommendations for monitoring to make sure that if this development, this project takes place, that everything is done to make sure that the heritage is safe. Now that, in the best case scenario, the consent authority, whichever of your um, government institutions gives them permission for the project, in the best case scenario, they will take those recommendations. And uh, in some cases, if it's very well done, they can even copy and paste them. In some cases, they're slightly changed, obviously, because the authority has the authority to do that. But largely, if those recommendations are based on consensus, because all of the stakeholders have agreed on them, they can be taken into the permission. And therefore, when the project is uh, granted permission, the developer has to listen to these recommendations. And as a result, the project proponent very often puts these into the tender documentation for the project. Because remember, the proponent is proposing a project, but it will actually usually be carried out by, uh, um, you know, contracting a building firm or whatever, according to the project. 
So these recommendations have now made their way to a tender process and they're given to the contractor. Um, this is that this is outside of, of the world that we usually work in as heritage people. But those of you who I know we've got a lot of engineers and architects, you'll have seen this on some uh, other types of projects. There's very often a social and environmental management plan that a contractor is obliged to have in most cases, which outlines how they're going to carry out their building project. These vary enormously in quality. But if one of the requirements of the tender is that the recommendations from the impact assessment get put into that plan, you can see there's a clear line from the conclusions of the impact assessment through to how the project is carried out on site. Now, I do want to be really clear, we're not talking about a management plan for the World Heritage property. I'm talking about the harsh reality of someone building uh, building a road, building a railway, building a pipeline, whatever it is. In our case, we've been looking at the, the idea of building um, the commercial shopping centre. If we can manage to do this well, we make sure that those results go through to this plan which manages the creation of the project itself. This document is the only one that will potentially be on site. So instead of having a report that just sits on a shelf and was a nice exercise that you carried out with your consultants, this is now the only document that might actually appear on the ground at your property. So I need, to, I just emphasize this because this is happening in a lot of places with environmental impact assessments. It's best practice for those. When we're working within heritage impact assessments, where uh, it's usually only heritage people in involved, we're not always doing the full process as it might be done. And it's worth us knowing what can be done and improve our practice so that we've got these mechanisms in place to, to ensure that things go well. I, I just repeat, this is the only time potentially when your conclusions from your impact assessment go through to the people working on the ground on the project. They were not, the builder was usually never involved in the impact assessment. They have no idea about your concerns. <laughs> they have no idea what the attributes of the World Heritage property are. If we're not getting better at making our report have a life after uh, the impact assessment, then we're, we're failing, we're wasting our energy. So I just offer you this as an example of one way in which we can really make sure that the work has uh, good repercussions for World Heritage. Um, like many of the things that, is, that are recommended for World Heritage, like management planning, some, we're having too many cases where, for example, a plan is written, but it's a document, it's put on the shelf in the office and is never implemented in life. We cannot have the impact assessment suffer in the same way. There are too many impact assessments, which also are simply written and then put to one side. And this is one way we can make sure they genuinely work. So that was one uh, key issue which is worth noting for after uh, you carried out the actual assessment. And the second thing to note, we mentioned this uh, on day one, is the concept of the strategic environmental assessment. I think many of the discussions in your groups have shown that uh, while we are looking at the moment at the level of a project, so we've been looking at impact assessment as if it was uh, the context of an environmental impact assessment, one proposal, but it's usually not one proposal. Um, our colleagues who presented the development efforts in Bethlehem showed us there are many different projects that are emerging. There's many great ideas, many you know, uh, problematic ideas, how do we deal with them? And it's usually not enough to deal with one project at a time. Um, if we are better at making sure that we've got policies that are strategic, we do better. Now I'm using the terminology strategic environmental assessment because we're on a, uh, an impact assessment course. For many uh, situations that you're working in, it's also, you, we do very similar things with urban planning, for example, or if you're taking a historic um, urban landscape approach, there's many different types of, you know, territorial planning. There's many ways in which we're taking the strategic approach, but you're using a different language. 
I'm just using the example here of the strategic environmental assessment because it links up very much um, with what we've been doing. It takes the same approach. Mm -hmm. And the World Heritage Committee is asking for these. So it's just worth you knowing they're out there. Um, this diagram explains the two. And it's not a question of uh, which one should I do? Should I do the strategic one or should I do the environmental one? They're both very useful. If you have a strategic environmental assessment, which is looking at your um, policies and plans, at a big scale, it can pick up on the fact that there's often more than one project and it can deal with cumulative impacts. That was an issue that lots of people were, were raising as a, as a question. And then if it's done well, the conclusions of that strategic assessment will already offer you a really strong foundation for your, for your impact assessment for an individual project. So you don't have to duplicate the work. You've already got this really strong understanding of the World Heritage property and its setting. And you're, uh, each time there's a project, you're in a very good position to judge it with uh, less work. So these are very useful to consider if they're needed. And so I just wanted to offer you one example, a concrete example, because it always helps us understand why they're useful. Um, this is a case from Canada, Wood Buffalo National Park, uh, which is a huge uh, landscape, as you can see here on the map. But you'll see the list to the side. This was a landscape which uh, there were many, many different projects being proposed, still being proposed today. There's lots of natural resources which are um, of great interest to a lot of people. And they were suffering from the fact that there was constant arrival of a new project and the need to do another environmental impact assessment over and over again. And it was, it was becoming problematic. There were too many projects to really, um, to, they, it was a constant sense of you know, almost stress. <laughs> You're all, there's yet another thing to have to manage. And um, actually, in this case, it was the local community, the, the native community who petitioned the World Heritage Committee and said, things are getting too serious. We need to do something about this. This is the World Heritage is at risk. And this is despite uh, environmental impact assessments. It's not that Canada doesn't do them. They do them very well. But it needed to take a strategic assessment approach, which was what the committee actually asked them to do. And there's been a lot of work on this uh, over in recent years, uh, which included involving the indigenous people. And they came out with a final um, strategic environmental assessment, which just took, uh, took a step back and looked at the entire property, what they needed to protect. Hang on, I can show you. This is just one page extracted. You'll see that they've, they've done, it, the logic is very similar to what we've done. So there should be nothing really new. They've taken the OUV and they have simply divided it down into values. It's slightly different to the table we're looking at, but the logic is very similar. And then this column is actually looking at, um, they go from OUV and they go through to, uh, what do we call them, attributes. Apologies, I've forgotten all my English today. And what they call valued components Valued components is actually the language in environmental impact assessment for attributes. What exactly do we want to ensure that we're uh, protecting? And um, so this was the approach they took and they've gone so far because it's a strategic one, they've got indicators. They want to make sure that, that in the future, they are going to be monitoring these attributes and making sure they understand what's happening. So with regards to their World Heritage um, difficulties, the World Heritage Committee was very happy with this. The, the advisory bodies have commended this as a very good uh, example of a strategic environmental uh, assessment. And they want to make sure, because they're happy with these conclusions, that all future environmental impact assessments use that as a basis. So as I said, it's very, once you've got that understanding of the OUV, you can then use it for all future assessments of projects. And they want this to be uh, also integrated into the management plan. So it's not a question of doing yet another assessment. This is uh, a way to almost resolve problems once and for all. And then all the conclusions can go into the other processes of managing world heritage. 
So they haven't solved all the problems uh, that they're facing, but they're in a very good position now to make decisions based on world heritage. So that was the presentation that I was going to give uh, last week, which just simply shows you what the next steps can be. So this concept that we can, um, we can ensure that the report has use and is useful after it is written, and then also considering whether or not a strategic approach might be helpful. As I say, in a lot of cases, it might be simply um, urban planning systems could be revisited and thought about with uh, World Heritage. And that, you'll be glad to know, is the last of our presentations on the process of impact assessment. You've got one more, just because you can't have enough presentations on a, uh, a Zoom course. Uh, this was the, the presentation for this morning. And um, this shouldn't take too long because these principles that I'd like to bring to your attention now are principles that we have tried to already communicate to you throughout this course. The reason I think it's worth summarising them again here before we conclude is because when we've been rewriting the guidance uh, document, the, um, the advisory bodies in the World Heritage Centre all agreed that they wanted um, to add a chapter to the guidance on principles. It's something that didn't exist in the 2011 document. And they wanted to really bring out what were the key messages. Um, and I've now been in lots of meetings with the, the three advisory bodies, so ICROM, ICOMOS and IUCN. We've had input from the World Heritage Centre. It's been reviewed by the International Association for Impact Assessment. So these are really the core messages that everyone involved has felt needed to be emphasised. And that's because um, environmental impact assessments have been taking place for a very long time, as you can see on this chart. In the uh, natural world heritage, those were being used for many, many years. And it was in 2011 that we started asking for a more specific version for cultural heritage. So it's now a decade since we've been looking at this. And we're still having problems. Some things are getting much better. Some things are still frustrating for everyone. So these principles also address those frustrations when reports, um, assessment reports are coming to the World Heritage Committee. How can we make sure that their things are getting better? because this is a key problem. You'll see from this quote, impact assessment has become a process to report on impacts rather than guiding the design of actions or proposals. So it's become clear, not just with World Heritage, but everywhere, that the report, writing a good report, a beautiful, glossy report, has almost become the end result. And we need to get better at making sure that re result actually impacts the proposal and changes the way we do things. And that's what's not happening. We're getting a lot of better reports, but what happens after the report is often not um, as desirable an outcome as we might want. So what to do? Participation. We've said this, I think, too many times. <laughs> Some people are getting very irritated. We, um, we need to keep talking about our stakeholders and our rights holders, about who needs to be involved when and how, who gets to um, really be involved in this process, and it should be throughout. We also need to make sure that we're better involving the right specialists. It is not enough to have a single uh, international consultant who flies in and thinks they know everything and then goes away. I give you the examples of the two cases we've illustrated this week. Uh, in Italy, we had a lawyer and in Sri Lanka, there was a coastal engineer, people who aren't traditionally part of the World Heritage team, but were essential for making sure we were addressing the right issues. Um, now, when the state's parties uh, agree that they are going to protect World Heritage, very often that has been considered we put a line on the map, a boundary around the property, and we protect what's inside. It's increasingly clear that the projects that are most affecting world heritage are in the buffer zone, like we saw in Tivoli, or even outside in the wider setting, like we saw in Sri Lanka and Gaul. These 
need to be considered, even if the project proposed is not within the boundaries, that's becoming very clear. And in some cases, there's even, this is a case, uh, case from uh, Kenya, huge, actually it's, it's a transboundary project that it goes across the entire country and ends up just outside the boundaries of the, of the buffer zone of uh, Lamu in Kenya. It's a huge project. In theory, it doesn't touch the World Heritage property. And yet, of course, it does in many ways. We need to be doing impact assessments when there are these huge multinational, uh, huge development projects. Uh, a neighborhood of a city, this is Liverpool. We, we need to be looking at them in these cases, but even in the cases of very small projects. This was uh, a case in Bulgaria where they're simply renewing the facilities for a small fishing port and the impacts might seem minor, but they still need to be considered. The question is not one of size, it's a question of the potential impact on AUV. And we need to get better at the timing. All too often, our impact assessments have been taking place after the design has been decided and construction in many place, cases is already taking place. And it's been a big failure of heritage. It's one of the reasons that we're suggesting that heritage needs to be, where possible, put back into the standard environmental impact assessment, because those are usually triggered in your national system much, much earlier. And it means that you can influence things and be part of that discussion much earlier. Um, I give. Here is just another quick example from the case in Tivoli in Italy. The project that uh, we had to assess had already been underway for a long time. Planning permission was already given. If we had been allowed to carry out the assessment much earlier in that time frame, the, um, the results might have been much easier to obtain. But we arrived very late. <laughs> so it, was, it was a huge problem. Uh, this one should be very obvious at this point. Um, the impacts need to be judged against their specific effect on outstanding universal value. We need to go back to the statement of outstanding universal value. You would be amazed how many impact assessments are being written with no reference to world heritage. And that needs to change. That's a big request from the advisory bodies. Reports are sent back to states parties asking them to be redone because there's no reference to World Heritage. So all our obsession in the first days about really understanding those values is because of that frustration. And we also need to look at uh, not just single projects, but also when there are broader trends, when there are cumulative impacts. In the case of uh, Villa Adriana in Tivoli, it wasn't just this one residential and commercial complex. The urban encroachment had been happening for most of the 20th century, and it was a massive problem because it was not a single project. We need to get better at looking at those other issues. <coughs> and we need to be looking at more than just single impacts like visual impacts. This was the example in Gaul again. The visual impacts were possibly not the big issue. It was maybe the indirect impact like tourism that needed to be really examined. <coughs> we also need to remember that impact assessments are very often iterative. That means we go back over the steps again. In Gaul, you'll remember we suggested changes to the, the project. The new project will need an impact assessment. These things are not linear. They need to be redone until the outcome is very clear. And in some cases, the, um, we need to consider whether the project is even needed. In some cases, we need to say no to the project because it's not appropriate for world heritage. And um, this ties into Eugene's day on management. If done well, uh, impact assessment should be very much connected to other management processes at our World Heritage properties. Many of the things that we do can be connected in a very healthy way to other management processes. 
and this I've just talked about. So I don't need to spend too much time. Strategic assessments are really useful. And we need to remember sustainable development. It's now um, part of what we do as World Heritage. And this is a tool that we can use to make sure that decisions are in line with that. And that um, is the final thought for the day. Have we got any questions? Thank you, Sara. By the way, this is the perfect um, uh, timing. I mean, uh, it's um, we are exactly on time, which gives us the opportunity to receive questions, uh, many questions, if uh, there are. Uh, yes. That. Okay. Uh, please, Zahra, you can uh, ask your yeah. question. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. Actually, while you were presenting, I was just thinking as if I'm doing this thing like in reality. And the most important thing I thought about is the OUV and the attributes and the values. And I thought because in some cases you presented that there was really not, not a problem, but not really defining the OUV that well or that it was not like uh, clear. So other interrupted it in, uh, negatively when it comes to impact assessment. So the issue in the impact assessment that we can't intervene with the OUV, the values or the attributes, we take them as they are from the World Heritage Nomination File or from the management plan. So the issue can we, during this process, like re-evaluate the OUV and the attributes or just we take them as they are because really you presented some cases, they were really not clear in writing or like using the good terms and the other question, or I ask after you answer it. The question now, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other question, like, uh, can I do uh, uh, an impact assessment uh, for a case I've never visited, I've never seen, just I've got like photos or information from far away? You can see Escanio's face. He's very. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but just. <laughs> Because the second uh, question is easier because I would say the answer is no. I I have yeah. seen examples and not just in impact assessment, lots of examples from heritage, and you make you draw the wrong conclusions and you don't see the reality of the situation. So I would say that's a, a no. And if you have a team who can't go, you need to really rethink. I mean, this is but this is a big question. It's the year of COVID, and so there's lots of, lots of us not being able to travel. To places but it's really um not to be advised so that uh, your second question was much easier your first question about OUV is a bigger debate um the short answer is you have to base yourself on the statement of OUV which exists and cannot change that's the official policy I think though that we are all aware that not all of them are written particularly well and that um, perhaps it's also the fact that uh, today 2020 our understanding of heritage has evolved over time and we understand heritage in a different way there are now new typologies new uh, recognition of different values being held by different people and it makes things much more complicated I think that is why it is so important that we we have to the world heritage purposes always report on AUV, but um, I hope in each case, we've always emphasized these other values as being also incredibly important. You couldn't, I wouldn't want to see a report that was only AUV and not other values. Sometimes values held by the local community that aren't recognized by the World Heritage community are equally, if not more important. So I think there should be both. Uh, the committee does ask that they're separated, which I think is fine because for their purposes they need that, but I would never just do OUV. And I think that's probably the only way to get out of this slight problem that not every statement was written in the way that we'd like to. And I think also recognizing that the statements were written, they were not intended for this sort of use. Operationalizing what is a long text is very difficult but it's the only tool we have. So it's, um, we are trying to do the best with a system that wasn't perhaps designed for this sort of work. 
but at the moment there aren't better there aren't better options so i hope that helped yeah thank you thank you thank you sarah thank you zahra uh, any other questions it's the opportunity guys i mean uh, <laughs> There are no other presentations after this one. So if you still have any, I see a hand, Tamara. Please, Tamara. Uh, yes, hi. I, I want to ask um, about if there's a, a way that we can um, have um, a sort of an impact assessment in the management plan, like not impact assessment for a specific project, but just um, a way to kind of have guidelines or borderlines like if uh, if a developer wants to do a certain project he can goes back to the management plan and have an idea of what is kind of possible and what is impossible yes <laughs> um <laughs> lots of enthusiasm i would uh, this is something we're talking about a lot at the moment actually is how we can already allow sites to be prepared in advance and i think this would be um, this sort of touches on the idea of the strategic assessment. They don't always have to be, um, you don't always have to have a, lots and lots of projects all ready to go. You just have to be, you're trying to be prepared for them. So it can help you if you've got multiple projects, but I think it's also an approach you can take just to be proactive in advance. So there's been discussions, um, with the revision of the guidance document, there's always the three advisory bodies which come together for these coordination meetings. And we're already beginning to discuss if we could already provide in the management plan or even in a nomination file to have OUV much more clearly specified so that other people like a developer might already understand it better. We could also be better with our boundaries of our property and our buffer zones. And we could also be um, perhaps clearer at explaining where particular activities might be suitable and others not. And obviously that's not something we can tell you on a course like this because it's dependent on the place. But already, if you've started to have this in this course, our hope would be that you, uh, you gain, it, I, I see impact assessment is not just a methodology, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of being very clear about what the property is and what you want to protect and how it might be affected by any type of change. And if you've already started thinking in that way, when you come to your management planning, you're already um, going to be much better at what you're putting in your management plan. So I think tomorrow you've just made me very happy because you've made, you've made the intellectual leap, which the advisory bodies are sort of slowly thinking how they can make it happen. And you've already discovered that the, the secret would be that. So uh, thank you. Your question makes me very happy. Please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, if there are no other questions, we can move to the next item of our agenda today, which will be an uh, explanation on the group work. Uh, Sarah, scan you, the floor is yours again. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Good morning, all. This is very short uh, summary, just to highlight uh, what you have done until here and what you are going to do during ne these next two hours. I just shared these two slides. This is the very last one presentation. <laughs> and so. Okay. So the point that um, Sarah Sarah I highlight during this uh, her slide uh, during this last slide is very important because this is summarized really summarized the principle that should uh, guide you during the process right and um, uh, during this final presentation that um, it's uh, it's quite difficult task but it's uh, could be possible to do to to be done. Uh, following uh, single steps that we try to highlight during our presentation. So focusing uh, uh, on uh, the 
understanding the property, uh, starting from the outstanding universal value statement uh, and understanding uh, why we are dealing, uh, asking to yourself and to your group, why we are dealing this process, which is the problem, which is the project that uh, is uh, uh, under the assessment. This is very important because uh, as we are already, uh, already focus on uh, the, the the process on impact assessment but our all should must always be focused on a specific uh, project that you are going to uh, assess uh, you have other tools as sarah described so the strategic one the uh, for larger and wider assessment but in this case you should understand the property and the project that, that was proposed <coughs> so uh, these are the first main steps and uh, following the others, so understanding going through the values and attributes table and going to the evaluation of the impacts, you can reach uh, uh, quite uh, 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 a good position in order to propose mitigation and alternatives. So this final task should not be uh, because there's no time, there's no, as we have said, we have not seen, uh, I don't know, the site by ourselves, we don't have a field visit, we really don't have time to really understand each part, each component of the, the, the property. But in this final scope, we are asking for a scoping study presentation. You should put yourself in the position uh, of a heritage authority that has been asked by the World Heritage Committee to organize an impact assessment. So the focus is, uh, is to your group will examine all the material that we have made available on the on the drive and uh, all, all your experience, previous experience uh, uh, about the property. Um, and you will take a, a short, very short presentation, so maximum 20 minutes uh, for each group because we, we want to have a, a very uh, great and uh, powerful discussion after this, uh, your presentation. Um, the presentation should contain all the information needed to the brief, uh, to brief a team of consultants. So you have to imagine this uh, scenario uh, who will carry out the impact assessment, but uh, you don't need to carry as I said, a full impact assessment. Um, but you have to identify very clear and you should have the um, ability to communicate because this is very important in order to, uh, to transfer your information to the others, in, the, in this case, uh, uh, the other groups and uh, all the participants, uh, the key issues, the key issues that you, you would need to be included in the impact assessment. So attributes of UV values, specific elements of the proposed project, and etc. Uh, in order to facilitate this process, uh, you should have received uh, the um, a template with uh, uh, a, a brief summary of the uh, values and attributes table. Uh, this is. Uh, we made this just to help yourself uh, to compare what you have done until here. So comparing what we have, what we have sent to your work about uh, values and attributes, you can reach uh, a, a, a good uh, position in order to highlight the very, uh, the main values and uh, related main attributes that are uh, needed to uh, describe uh, uh, in a wider uh, uh, description the, the entire property. Uh, so we just try to suggest an index, a template for your presentation, not should be so long, so maximum 20 slides, starting with the description of the property and the description of the proposed project. So the two main components of the this uh, impact assessment. Um, we want that you can highlight uh, your methodological approach in order to understand if all the key uh, steps are uh, uh, has been uh, understood and uh, has been uh, has not been problematic. So, and uh, to specify the aims of your impact assessment, this is very important because you have to reach an objective. You have to reach a aim. Um, the other, the second part should be. The, the part of the exercise that you've done, you have done during the uh, during these days. So the stakeholder analysis, following the 
the template that uh, Sarah provided, uh, the values and attributes assessment. And during this values and attributes assessment, you should be you should present the analytical table of the key values. So trying to collect together all your discussion and highlight uh, the main values. So one, two, three, four main values. Um, try to transfer the attributes that you highlight on a map in order to describe if uh, exists some relations between the, in order to describe better the complexity of the property. Um, your comments and your consideration about the OUV. Uh, a few slides about management system analysis. So if there are key issues to highlight, potentially relevant to the impact assessment, uh, potential factor that's affecting the protégé. This, uh, I know that this is a very uh, difficult task, but in very uh, brief way, you should be able to highlight uh, also in this case, the key components of the management system. Um, a preliminary impact identification. So also in this case, uh, you should start from an analytical table. As we have done, uh, uh, um, I participated with group two, I remember. So we started, we already started to, uh, to put the cross in the analytical table of the potential impacts on the uh, values that we highlighted. So you should present this analytical table. Uh, maps drawing in order to, uh, if needed, see if in order to describe what are the, the factors and the impacts that you highlighted. So I don't know, uh, drawings out of, of the facade, uh, maps of the position of the church in, in relation to the project, some, all these kind of uh, uh, graphics uh, elements that could uh, help to understand your uh, approach. Uh, and the third, the, the final result should be, if possible, uh, to identify the main one and uh, to, 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 to try to, to give a, a, a scale of severity of this potential impact. So we suggested a graded color scale, but you can use also uh, other approach if you are familiar with this uh, um, severity uh, management of the data. But maybe the graded score scale should be the simple one. So starting from green to red, for example. Um, final step, any potential mitigation and enhancement measures. Uh, so you, sh you should list uh, your possible mitigation uh, proposals um, and you should be able to be specific to this to the impacts that you uh, identi identify. So uh, impacts one has this list of poss possible mitigation or possible enhancement proposal if uh, if any exist and uh, a very brief comments and conclusion is very appreciated in order to uh, to trigger the discussion after uh, your presentation uh, i think this is uh, if there are any questions about the exercise uh, i can we can answer Thank you, Asken. Um, it's just to note that we will be um, splitting the, the two groups uh, into, the two, into two groups um, at uh, 11. Um, and we'll be spending uh, the last two hours of this day in the group work. So if you would like to ask any question before we go to uh, this 10 minute break, you can do it now. Perhaps I could add a note on logistics just to explain, because we do have the rest of this morning and also an hour tomorrow morning. I'd imagine that um, after our break, we would, Escanu and I will be with the same groups as last time. So we can continue, we can finish the discussions we started together, um, but then it would be useful just to, in those groups, divide perhaps uh, responsibility, like each person could take a, um, one of the points and prepare one or two slides on that with the idea that um, tomorrow morning everybody has prepared their couple of slides you've discussed the content you want each person has taken responsibility for preparing a couple of slides and perhaps you email it to whoever is the best person in your group to put all the slides together in a single presentation so tomorrow morning when you finish that coordinate that final coordination and we present uh, we'll have Eugene with us again who will be, but she's very interested to see what you uh, come up with, what the, what Palestine 
includes in comparison to some of the other national courses we've done. Um, and one person would then share that presentation on the screen. So just in terms of working in our groups, uh, we'll be with you for a short time, but then you, I think we need to just divide tasks between you. Does that make sense as well? Yeah, I can see Zara's got a question as well. Zahra, please. Yes, hi. Regarding the work, because the other day we were discussing in the group about the stakeholders, actually we found a lot of attributes and details of the attribute that we found that many, many stakeholders, right holders, institutions are involved. And my question, they are, as we've written up, there are really too many. And do you think like including all these people will really make our job easy? I mean, like, uh, it's really for looking at all the attributes for the buffer zone and the core zone and for the stakeholders, too many people, too many institutions. How do you advise us really to handle this issue? Thank you. Yeah, um, well, part of the reason why we chose the template that we gave you, which was the divided into four sections. When I've used that before, we've listed all the names but according to the category in which people come uh, for example in this presentation i can imagine you saying this this quadrant are all the, the most important people who need to know everything throughout the whole process but it's only these groups and individuals and we intend to speak to them at the beginning of the process consult them halfway and perhaps review the final results with them at the end but you might decide that there's another uh, another group in a different corner of that page where you say um, the principle that they need to be informed is fantastic but there will simply be an announcement on a website or there will be a single public meeting so the idea is that in for example in your final presentation you don't have to tell us a long list of people you could show us on a slide that you've put in the you know the most important uh, institutions groups whoever and then you can just simply tell us how you would discuss each category. So the, um, when we said, I think we called it stakeholder analysis, I'm more yeah. expecting that kind of level of, these are the really key people to keep going throughout the whole thing. These people can just have information, but I'm not going to spend as much time with them because as you point out, speaking to everybody is probably not physically possible always with, um, in these cases, but to know that you've thought about it Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zahra. Thank you, Sarah. I just would like to reiterate what just Sarah mentioned uh, concerning the group work. Um, as you know, we had in the past four groups and in preparation for tomorrow, uh, please, please, um, whoever did not participate previously, uh, we would like to give that um, uh, chance to uh, uh, whoever did not ask or present or commented on anything during this uh, training to do it uh, today in the group work and tomorrow as well while presenting your, uh, uh, your work at the end. Um, now, um, if there are no other questions or comments, um, we can go to a uh, five minute break. <laughs> so we can uh, come back to, uh, uh, to the breakout rooms for the group work. Okay, I don't see anything. Let's go for the break and come back at 10, at 11, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> 